So where we were yesterday was um, almost at the end of proving the proposition that if f is c2 near a point a, then you have essentially the Taylor approximation of over 2 of v2 that says you can compute f at a point near a by f at a plus linear term plus a quadratic term, which we showed yesterday was of the form of the quadratic form built out of the Hessian at some nearby point A plus squiggle H, or some squiggle between 0 and 1. And we, we were almost done deducing from this, and I will finish it momentarily, that therefore you can use the, what masquerades as the second degree Taylor polynomial at A which uses the Hessian at A but now you're not entitled to say it's equal. Now you have to allow some error and the error is going to be small compared to the magnitude of h squared, at least for small enough h. Okay. So I was trying to get you to believe why this should be true, and I'm going to give you a few more technical details today. Namely, because f is c2, the second partials at a plus squiggle h aren't very far from the second partials at a. And so if you compute the quadratic terms here, those should in turn not be far off, and that the error should be quadratic essentially, or smaller than quadratic in H. So let's see. So let's, let's examine the end of this a bit more carefully. So if I look at the Hessian matrix uh, at A plus squiggle H minus the Hessian at A, you agree with me because of continuity of the second partials that all the entries of this matrix minus this matrix should be small. So as small entries when h is small. Okay, so that's just by continuity. <laughs> oh, this is continuity of second partials. So here is a Basic question for you. Question. Question. If A is a an n by n matrix, all of whose entries are at most, let's say, some constant C in absolute value. What can you what is the biggest the norm of A can be? So I'm giving you a three by three matrix and all the entries are less than point one in absolute value. Give me a bound on the norm. Well, so we, what do we know so far? We know that if you have a diagonal matrix, the norm is the max of the diagonal entries absolute values. Other than that, we only have an exact formula if the matrix has rank 1. So I'm just asking for a brute force estimate. Imagine taking your matrix A and multiplying it by a 
unit vector x and saying what's the biggest that magnitude of that product could be. So in fact, imagine you, you know there's a unit vector x that gives you a maximum. That's from the maximum value theorem. Imagine you picked the x that gave you the maximum. And, you, and sit there and think about doing this and getting an answer and ask yourself, what's the longest this vector answer could be? N C. Yes, yeah. N C squared power. Yeah, we do the square root. Square root of n. There's the N C squared. It might be N C squared. I don't know, actually. Is it no, like the length should be... It should, it, should, it should be linear in C, Matthias. That's, that part's right. So I, Matthias is on the right track here, I think. So imagine doing this multiplication here. And you compute the dot product of one of the rows of A with X. And you have, like, N times... And we're saying X is univector. Then what's the biggest this can be? N C. N times C. Times C. Is it N times C is squared? Is square root of X? No, because because that's the unit vector. X is a unit vector. Okay, so it is N C. And then yeah. And you could conceivably have C C C C C C. Yeah. Right. So you can. And so you have n of them, n of them, <laughs> multiplied by the x's. So what would you have? You have c times. You could imagine having c's here, and then. No, it's. Is it n to the three half c? Because there's n. Yeah. Things gotta be n plus a c, right? And you know the magnitude of x. So the magnitude of AI is at most what? C. No. If all the entries are C's, C root M. It's going to be C root M. Oh my god. Did I get that right? Yeah. Right? Because. Did you say equal C root M? I'm saying the most. So the most this could be is a vector. Think about. Each entry is at most is C in absolute value. So when you do the sum of the squares, you get C squared plus C squared plus C squared, n times, square root. So you get that. So what does it follow, therefore, that the magnitude of AX could be at most what? You have a vector whose entries are most that long, it has n entries, times root so you're going to get another root n, so you'll get n times c. Okay. All right, what's the upshot of all this? The upshot is, if I pick delta small enough to control the size of h, we can choose delta so that the norm, well, yeah, so that the entries of Hess F at A plus squiggle H minus Hess F at A all have absolute value. Less than, hmm, what should I have? How about epsilon over 2n? Right, so by continuity, given any epsilon, I can make all the entries of this be less than epsilon over 2n by making magnitude of h less than delta what does this mean if i if i if i got this right then the norm of this matrix is it 
two pounds of chloride in each. Will come out less than what? From what we said here. If all this I'm using for my C. Epsilon over two. So I'll just get epsilon over two. And I'm not sure I even need the two. I think epsilon over n will be good enough. Then, then I'll get less than epsilon here by this, right? Letting C be epsilon over n. Then n times C will be epsilon. And that will imply that the, the quadratic form using the point A plus squiggle H minus the quadratic form using the Hessian of A will be less than epsilon magnitude H squared. So I did this at the end of class yesterday, but let me remind you how that went. Whoops. If you take this is h, little h, dot this matrix times h, minus little h, dot this matrix times little h. So if the norm of the matrix is less than epsilon, what's the biggest h dot a h can be. Well, by Cauchy-Schwartz, remember, this is less than or equal to the magnitude of h times the magnitude of a h, which in turn is less than the norm of a times magnitude h. So I get norm of a magnitude h squared, and the norm of a here is less than epsilon. Um, how do we go from like epsilon over <coughs> two n to just epsilon? Why? Why? I. Whoops. To be epsilon over n. I was trying to erase and rewrite it because the erasing was so messy. I, I wanted to just get rid of the two. <laughs> yeah, that was a typo. Thank you. Right. So if all the terms have let absolute value less than epsilon over n, then this is epsilon. Right. Because epsilon over n. Times n is epsilon. Okay, so end of proof is going to be what's this epsilon of h? So we have the Hessian at the approximate point. We're saying its difference, well, the quadratic form, right? So f of a plus h is f of a plus the derivative of f of a times h plus one half this Hessian quadratic form at a plus squiggle h. And we're saying that this, this gets to be a pain to write, this term is one half the Hessian at a turned into the quadratic form, plus, so I'm just adding a clever zero here. I'm saying, how do I get this from this? I take this term, and I add the term that I want, minus the term I added because I wanted to add it, all with of H's. Okay, check it out. Do you agree? These terms match. I have the Hessian quadratic form at little a. I want to have it equal to this. Well, then I add that and subtract the Hessian term at a. So these are canceling, and this is this. I made this harder than it is. I added a clever zero. I added this minus itself. That was called an inheritance. Well, but now this is my epsilon of h. Yeah. 
right? I said it's equal to blah, 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 plus error. Well, this is the error. And it has to be less. And now what do I know about the size of the error? It's less than. Well, it's less than a half epsilon magnitude h squared whenever h is less than delta n magnitude. So does that fit this? Well, let's see. So if I take the error and I divide it by magnitude of h squared, it's certainly less than <laughs> half epsilon whenever h is small enough. But this is the standard game. You can make epsilon as small as you want by making delta smaller. So that means that epsilon of h over magnitude h squared here is less than half epsilon. And I can make that as small as I want by making delta smaller. That means this goes to 0 as magnitude h goes to 0. That's the limit definition of something going to 0 as magnitude h goes to 0. Definitions, you can make it as small as you want by making magnitude h small enough. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying we're done with the proof. So the error term, this epsilon of h term, is coming just from estimating how small the error is when you use the exact quadratic form Hessian versus the one you want today. Okay. So the application of this, and then we're done with all this theory stuff, is consequently, here's the, here's the second derivative test. So suppose A is a critical point, of f, and suppose f is c2 near a, then if a is a critical point, what do I have? I have f of a plus h is f of a plus 0 plus this quadratic form term plus a small error. So I'm going to claim that if the quadratic form given by the Hessian at A is positive definite, then that means A is a local min. If this quadratic form is <laughs> negative definite, then A is a local max. If this quadratic form is indefinite, then A is a saddle point. Well, I've left out some cases. All the semi, semi, hemi, positive, negative, wishy washy. Don't know. If you if the quadratic form is anything other than these three, don't know. In any other case, we're not sure. How do you like a theorem that says that? Not as much as I like a theorem that wouldn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So remember, we've already talked about the examples here. Consider the function x squared plus or minus. In fact, plus or minus x squared. And then you can put in y cubed. <coughs> You all agreed that this was a saddle point. 
at zero. Because y cubed would be positive or negative. But the, but the Hessian would be positive semi-definite if you have a plus here. Positive semi-definite. So it could be a saddle. And I could put a minus here. And then it would be negative semi-definite. And it could still be a saddle. But all I have to do is change the y cubed to plus or minus y to the fourth. If you have plus x squared plus y to the fourth, it's a local min. If you have minus x squared minus x to the fourth, it's a lo local max. And you can't tell any of these apart from the just looking at hf0. So with hf0 being positive semi-definite, it could be a local min or a saddle. If it's negative definite, it could be a local max or a saddle. And I could make it worse. If you allow this quadratic form to be zero, yeah, officially is the zero quadratic form positive semi-definite? It depends on the definition. What did the perhaps flawed author use as the definition? Is positive greater than zero? Positive semi-definite, greater or equal to zero for all x and equal to zero for some non-zero x. That did not, that allows it to be zero for all x and it's still called positive semi-definite. You might want to quibble with the definition that the author used. Some books might say, and I would actually side with them, that positive semi-definite should mean greater than zero for some x and zero for some x and always greater than or equal to zero. That would be a plausible definition of positive semi-definite. But with the definition in the book, and with the definition that I believe I put on the board a week ago, the zero quadratic form is allowed to be positive semi-definite or negative semi-definite. So basically, when you aren't one of these good cases, all hell can break, break loose and you just give up. <laughs> all right, so I'm not going to bore you by making you sit through a proof of all three cases, but I am going to show you how, you how we do one of them, and then we'll call it quits. The, so let's just do the case. that the quadratic form is positive definite. And you can adapt it immediately for the negative definite, and the book has the case of indefinite. You can look at that if you want. So what does positive semi-definite mean? It means that the function hfa of little vector h is positive for all non-zero vectors h. So what does that mean is true if you look on the unit sphere of h's? You have a positive function everywhere on the unit sphere. Quadratic polynomial. That makes it continuous. What do we know about the unit sphere? Bounded. Or compact. Or compact. Continuous function on a compact has a max and has a min. Therefore, there is some constant c so that h f a of vector h is greater than or equal to c for all unit vectors little h. That's the minimum part of the maximum value theorem. 
But this is quadratic. So what does this tell you if you put in H's that didn't have unit length? We've done this trick before. I'm going to say the magnitude of h squared comes in there. Remember why? Remember how we got the stuff with norms and, and a magnitude of h pulling out? Why is this? Well, because it's coming from dotting with h and having an h here. And what happens if you have a vector that's length 3? Well, you can turn it into a unit vector, say that on the unit sphere, this functions at least c, and then how do you scale it for a vector that's length 3? Times 1, 3 for here, and another 3 for there. It's quadratic. So if you, if you look at a quadratic function and you scale your variable by 3, the quadratic function scales by 9. So in general, you're going to have magnitude h squared here. Okay, we're almost at the end. So I want to look at this. And I want to say to myself, what happens if A is a critical point? I know that this Hessian quadratic form term is satisfying this for some c positive. What, what does this tell me? How do I decide if it's a local min or not? I want to look at f of a plus h and say what happens to f of a when I add the h term. What's happening here? Zero. Zero. So what are we saying? We're saying that I add this quadratic term to see what the function looks like if I change a a little bit. What do I know about this term? It's positive. It's positive when h isn't zero. But what I'm worried about is is it positive enough that the error can't catch it? Could it be that the error, this is what we were talking about the other day, uh, yesterday when we were doing the cubic stuff, and I said I'd get to something just like it. Could this error, this is what was worrying Matthias yesterday, could this error counteract this positive term, and could the error be negative enough that the function actually went down? It's not if c is at least 1. But you can, you can choose c over, you can choose... No, you can't choose c. You can yeah. choose h. You can, sorry, you can choose epsilon, which uh, to be c h squared, for example. And then, or whatever you need to be, so that like... Choose epsilon smaller then, let's see, smaller than half C maybe? Wait, choose <laughs> epsilon. <laughs> In, you should just say, say infer proof. <laughs> Stop confusing me. <laughs> Then what do I know? If for then our limit definition gives us a delta for h sufficiently small, for h less than the appropriate delta, we know that the error 
is less than epsilon times the magnitude of h squared in absolute value. Could this be negative enough to counteract that term? So this is just a balancing act. You've got the, the script h moving you up. You possibly have the error moving you back down. But can it move you back down enough to make trouble? So my term here with the 1 half script h plus epsilon, I'm claiming that the smallest it could be is what we have here. We have 1 half c magnitude h squared because of this. And then the epsilon could be negative. But what's the most it could be negative? You would be subtracting epsilon magnitude h squared, right? The worst you could do is subtract this off. And in fact, I lose the greater than or equal to because this is a strict inequality. All right, well, let's do algebra here. What do I know about how I pick the epsilon? It's less than 1 half c. It's less than 1 half c. So what's this? Greater than, greater than, greater than zero. zero. Okay, so f of a plus h is f of a plus stuff that's positive whenever h isn't zero. And small enough. Done. It's a local name. Once you got bigger. Okay. So you play the same game with negative definite and with saddle, you just have to make sure that you can guarantee that this term is both positive and negative. So you have to choose your C's depending on both positive behavior and negative behavior, and I'm not gonna it's written out in the book, you know the guy. Okay. You're exhausted. So you've had one homework assignment of, or actually two, of doing max-min problems where you have some sort of constraint on the cost of the box, on the angles of a triangle, on planes that all pass through a fixed point one, two, two. You haven't gotten to that one yet. Get working on homework fast. So you, you're, every max spin problem we've done, there's been some geometric or physical constraint. Every max spin problem, pretty much that you did in single variable calculus, you had that. You had some problems where I just said find the max and the min on of this function on this closed integral. But most of the problems that were applied, you had to read through all the words and set up a function subject to some constraint. And I'm now going to tell you. The right way, you should have, you should have been taught. To do max min problems. So you you your suffering must continue through the assignment that you're turning in tomorrow. So, but after you're done suffering with the homework that's due tomorrow, this is the way you should be doing these problems. So it's off limits until after the homework's turned in tomorrow. So we don't, but we don't do the suffering on a test. You're not required to suffer on a test. <laughs> yeah. In a different way. Now, this will not, right, just in a different way. This will not absolve you of the compactness proofs to, to worry about whether there is a max or a min. That, that stays the same. This saves you the pages of horrible algebra. All right, so here, because it's a little chilly out, I have a topical question for you. I warned you yesterday that this was going to happen. 
so we're, we've gone off to Lake Herrick. It's a little chilly out, but we're, we've gone out on a boat on the on the lake. The boat is not bigger than the lake. But unfortunately, Sammy brought along too many rocks, and the boat is sinking. <laughs> so here we are, minding our own business, sailing on the on the lake. And all of a sudden, we notice that the boat is sinking. And. So some smart person in the boat, so that's not Dan. Uh, Sammy over here. No, he's already been bad enough to put all the rocks I don't trust him. But we're going to take one of his rocks and we're going to be allowed to use it. How, how is the smart person in the boat going to figure out the closest point on the seashore here, on the lake shore, for us to swim to so that we have the least chance of freezing and dying in the lake? It's the it's the one. Throw the rocks at Well, we can throw the rocks at Sammy, but the boat's already got a hole in it because the rocks fell down because he wasn't paying attention and punched the hole. Do you drop it in the water and see where the ripples get to first? So we're gonna. So the the, the point of having some of the rocks in the boat is that we have a rock that we can toss in the water. And we can watch the ripples. And how are we going to decide, based on watching the ripples from the rock, how are we going to decide what point on the lake shore is closest? You can do one or two things. With math. You can either see like with, well, with math, of course. In what direction the ripple, the first ripple that comes back to you comes, or oh, you're no. being too fancy. No. No. Next, you're going to tell me to do dispersion and refraction. Uh, What's light? Come on. Well, come on. <laughs> no, come on. The first. You're, you're taking this too far. The first short. Yeah, the first short. So what? First of all. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to solve a problem to minimize the distance from the point that we're at so A is where Sammy's sinking us and we're trying to find the point of least distance that satisfies What constraint? What x am I looking for? <coughs> Points along the shore. So I'm trying to I'm trying to put x over here. Maybe that'll be the uh, lifeguard who's waving at us, saying, "Get out of the water," and he's standing at the place that's closest to help us know. Lifeguards always are help helpful. So x. We want the point on the lake shore that makes this distance smallest. So that's going to be the condition that x is on the lake shore is going to be saying, well, there's some equation in the form of a level set for the lake shore. So what are these ripples that described. The concentric circle, but they're level sets of, of, of f. So you're looking at level sets of f, and you're saying here f is half a mile, here it's two thirds of a mile. You're trying to We're find. Done. Swim that far. <laughs> you're trying to find the point on the lake shore which is closest, so what should happen? It should be the point that the first ripple hits when it hits the ground, yeah. when it hits the lake shore. The, the ripples go along, and they go along, and they go along. Eventually, if the ripple could travel on land, if it were an alligator instead of a ripple, <laughs> it would go like that. So it went from being, the level curves of F went from being entirely inside the lake 
to being partly outside, there must have been a point, hypothetically speaking, there must have been a point here, which should, which should be in a different color, where it just went from being inside to being outside, and so it should be tangent there. So that's the moral of the story. So it's still pretty Sammy. Make, make sure Sammy leaves all his rocks at home. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the, the strategy is going to be, with some hypotheses, find points on the constraint set at which the level sets of F and the, and the constraint curve are tangent. So here's your constraint, and here's your level curve of F. When, when F's level curve is just radiating out and just touching, it should be tangent there. Okay, well, how do you decide if two curves are tangent at a point? Dan's really being quiet today. <laughs> Got to do something here. How do we decide if these two curves are actually tangent at that point? The normal vectors should be equal, parallel, parallel, or parallel means scalar multiple of, doesn't it? At which the gradient of that is parallel to the gradient of G. Now, what we'll get to either tomorrow or definitely on Friday is situations where your constraint set is given by multiple equations. But today, we're just going to do this. So, so you want to think about finding points where the, these are true, the gradients parallel to the gradient, and, of course, you have to be on the constraint set. So this is now, once you've written this down, you're done with your calculus, and you now just do algebra. But the algebra is not pages messy like the ones you've been doing for homework, or that I did in class last week. So let's do some examples. I will give a more rigorous proof than dropping Sammy in the water for why you should. Would that be a fun proof? Proof by induction. Proof by sharks. Proof by sharks. So let's go. Let's do some examples. Um, shall I make you? Suffer and redo the open box problem? No. Um, no. no. Alright, well let's alright, let's see. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's do another one first. Find what is the inscribed end on. We did triangle, but I'll do end on now. Of maximum perimeter in the circle. Now again, I remind you, this is just showing you how to find the critical points. It's not telling you that there must be a max or there must be a min. That's, a, that's your separate compactness argument still. All right, end on. So how do I set this up as a calculus problem? How do you N is fixed, let, let, say uh, 27. Would you rather start with 3? Wait, I'm confused. Wait, are we trying to find out what N is? is I feel like no, N fix an N. 
after oh. the student scratch. So what do you mean then what is it? Oh, because you can it doesn't have to be a regular one. It can be oh uh, that makes more sense. <laughs> okay. So the answer should be you get yeah, it's like So you get it's a circle. Maximum perimeter when it's a regular. Regular. So I have a function. So what are my variables going to be? Well, I'm going to set this up exactly like we did the problem with the triangle. Let's let the angles be our various variables. Oh, that's so. So I have x1, x2, up to xn, my central angles. Yes, but you're going to see how simple this is compared to, even I've thrown an n at you and it's still going to be way simpler than what we did last time. What, what's our constraint? So they all add up to 2 pi. I'll figure out it. All right, the angles add up to 2 pi. These are the central angles. They all add up to 2 pi radians. OK, what's the function of these angles? I want to do perimeter. Well, we did this last week. And you did area for homework, Sorry. right? Yeah. But I did perimeter in class. Sorry. So remember what we did? We, we went split the angle down the middle. And we said this length is twice sine of, sine of half the angle. Yeah. Two sine of half. Okay, so I want to maximize this function. You presumably could make a compact this argument saying I have things that are greater or equal to zero and add up to 2 pi. That's a compact set in, in, in n space. It's closed and bounded. You could, you could make that argument. I'm going to skip it because we've done that enough. So I want to maximize f subject to the constraint that the sum of the x's is equal to 2 pi. Well. My methodology is take the gradient of f, take the gradient of g, say they're parallel. Well, I'll do the hard one, gradient of g. No, it's just one. It's the vector of all ones. Okay, now you do the easy one. What's the gradient of f? And by the way, the book, I think, does this with derivative matrices rather than gradients. You can do whichever you're comfortable with. If you want to write your matrices this way, fine. But just be consistent. Either use gradients for both or use derivative matrices for both. Conveniently, the chain rule cancels out the two and the one half for us. Okay, so now you ask yourself, how can this vector be a scalar multiple of that vector? If and only if, these all have to be the same. So gradient of f is a scalar multiple of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, if and only if all the cosines are equal. Well, the only way that can happen, unless, I mean, you have to stop and think about it. But if n's at least 3, there's no way you can have one of the angles be equal to another one shifted by no. So for cosine, remember that these are the ones that match. Oh, yeah. So there's no way you can use a positive angle and 2 pi minus it for two of your angles and then have them all add up to 2 pi and be positive. So it's not too hard to see that they all have to have the same cosine and be between 0 and pi, say, 
And the only way that happens is if all the angles are equal. So a regular polygon gives you the optimal. Okay, so tomorrow I'll do some more interesting examples, including redoing the one that we've done before, but I'll do some other ones. Mm -hmm. um, I miss how we came up with F. Is it like the, like the red length is the sign of the Yeah, so we, we did, I did the same way I did in class last week. We split the triangle in half uh, okay. into two congruent right triangles. So that it's this side is sine of, of the angle over two because this is a unit circle. It's sine of the angle. This is x1 over 2. Right. Opposite of hypotenuse. Oh, it's x1 over 2 divided by. Okay, I got you. Okay, like, never mind. I figured it out. Or actually, am I wrong with the 2? No, I think no, you're right. Because right. 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 that's the angle. I was thinking, right. like, no, but it's half base times. But you have 2 then. Oh, I'm doing perimeter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. My brain switched to area, and all of a sudden I got it wrong. Yeah, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll continue with more examples tomorrow, including trying to solve for the norm of a matrix, finally, that isn't one that's obvious. Okay.